Buffalo, Tim, and I'm here as uh, not usual with special Tim, Tim Bender from Hooded Horse. We're going to be talking about publisher type stuff. So Tim and Tim, uh, Tim B, welcome here. Welcome. Good to have you with us. I'm Tim and this is Cooler Tim. I'm excited yes. to talk to you. <laughs> Both of us Tims here. Yes. And I apologize to everyone for my back room and the Christmas tree still being up and there's going to be a giant 120 pound dog that sooner or later will jump into the middle of this conversation. So apologies in advance for that. I'm here at home. I, like I think doggos nice add to the value of the live stream for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it brings a little bit of a little bit of order and structure to what is often a rabbly kind of uh, conversation. We, we've through the conversation, we've got our folks in chat. Hello, everyone in chat. Let us know if you can hear us. Let us know if there's any echoes. Let us know if we've got our technology right for a change. I suspect we haven't, but uh, good to let us know any of that kind of stuff. If you've got any questions for Tim B as we go along, then just fire it in the chat. And uh, Tim, I'm going to start off with a, a very broad conversation about publishers. Back in ye olden days, when I was first getting into the games industry, publishers were these, uh, you know, high rolling, cigar smoking, money lenders who had power over all things. And uh, developers would uh, grovel and beg and come up with a two page document that says, here's a fancy game I'd like to make. And then publishers would bestow upon them millions and millions of dollars to make this fancy game. And everyone would cross their fingers and hope for the best. How has publishing of video games change what's the landscape nowadays how does a what does a publisher do in today's day and age yeah um you know and i'll uh i'll answer from my experience on this stuff and you know as always if there's any place that you think i'm i'm wrong about please let me know um because as anyone i'll, I'll probably say well i mean in the course of you know this interview i'll probably say 10 things that are wrong so well, let's hope we keep it to 10. Um, so I think there is still room for the kind of publishing arrangement that you're talking about it still exists. Um, it exists primarily with established studios with very large budgets. So there is um, the, you know, sort of publisher as providing the needed funding for a studio to operate and to, to complete a game still exists. I mean, you still have many studios. I mean, they're still indies, basically, but they're sort of the triple I side of things that are working with budgets for games of $2 million and more. Uh, many of those don't have the uh, financial resource to do that without a publisher. Um, so the publisher uh, comes in and you know does that sort of arrangement and basically funds the thing from inception. Uh, I think there are two ways of looking at that. One is that it's sort of it's a benefit publishers provide in that they are providing the needed funding for a game to get made that otherwise would not have had that. But there's the other side of it is that there are elements of how publishing has worked traditionally in the industry and continues to work that basically trap developers, establish, even establish very successful indie developers in a cycle of being reliant on those kind of publishing deals. Um, various elements of that, including 100% recoup terms, where often the developer will have released their prior game, even if it's doing well, the publisher is entitled to 100% of return of all of its costs on that game, which means that in many cases, an indie developer might have a very successful game, but their prior publisher is still recouping cost. That indie publisher isn't looking at getting any revenue anytime soon. Um, and then especially if the uh, if there's quarterly payments instead of monthly in the contract, there'll be another three month delay. So they need to move on to a next project, have a new publisher come in and fund their operations. Otherwise they have to start laying people off. So there are sort of positives and negatives in how that kind of large scale in the publishing work. Sorry, you have something Tim? Yeah, I was gonna say, there are publishing contracts where the publisher will recoup their funds even from games they didn't publish, like your future games. No, or, I don't think there's that. What I mean is that like basically, so, yeah, so basically, so let's say you're an indie developer and you just completed a game under one of these kind of publishing contracts that we're talking about. And the your first publisher of that first game has 100% recoup and is still recouping their costs on that game. Uh, and then maybe you're waiting for quarterly payments to come in and such. Uh, and also, to be frank, when publishers, usually the way it's traditionally operated, when publishers fund almost all the game, they're taking over, you know, a large majority of the revenue. So even after that recoup period's over, the indie developer may not be getting all that much of the revenue. So basically it's, um, they need a new publisher to come in and fund operations uh, in order for them to continue and not have to lay people off. So that that is a part of how things work, that basically there's, the way things are set up, yeah. you know, publishers provide fundings for these large scale games, but oftentimes you can, I mean, it, it's a little limited in a way too, because the studio is sort of trapped in the need for another publisher to fund the next game, and then the next game will need another one to fund it. Um, which 
you know, I don't mean to I, right off the bat sound doom and gloom about anything. It's just there are always positives and negatives to everything. And, you know, the, uh, publishers providing the full development funding for games comes with um, some, you know, consequences, at least in how public contracts, you know, operate. All that having yeah. been said, you know, it's not invariable. Personally, we never do 100% recoup deals. Um, even when we're funding development, we, we, we never do that. Developers always get some percentage from the beginning. Um, and yeah, so then there, so that that's a part of the the, the, the industry that still exists in, in, in terms of, you know, these the larger budget games. Um, now, not that this could be replicated on a smaller budget. Now, of course, you could have the same arrangements, the exact same arrangements with a budget of 100,000, 200,000 or something. And, and those do exist, which are unfortunate because at that budgetary level, probably the publisher shouldn't be claiming quite the same rights. Um, that having been said, there's always more pressure on indie developers who run a very, you know, what is large for an indie studio because there's a lot more cost, there's a lot more immediate need. Um, but yeah, that that's part of it. So that's, I'm here giving you a typology of things. Those are the, 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 that's sort of part of how publishing operates and part of how publishers are still relevant, um, you know, to answer Rick's question. The other part is, of course, uh, exists a, a range of scale. So then you've got everything else that isn't that. So you've got developers funding part uh, of the project and publishers contributing some funding development. Um, you've got publishers uh, operating primarily to provide marketing and localization and, and things like that. And you've got an entire world of different deals that fall in that area. Um, that is, you know, and yeah, so that, that that's sort of my typology of things, I suppose. So I've seen a lot of publishers come out in the last few years that are primarily that they 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 usually work with games with traction, and they're primarily localization and uh, porting houses, basically. So they they take whatever game you have, and then they'll put it on other platforms. They'll get other languages and all that stuff. Um, do you think that those are different than traditional publishers in a lot of ways, or do they kind of have some similar qualities to them as far as like the deal an indie would get? Yeah, well, I, I will say, you know, it, it's sort of such an open topic to talk about marketing and such. And, and, and you know, that is the, so our, ourselves, so first just to introduce sort of Horace, um, which probably should have done at the beginning if I'd been thinking. Yeah, about let's, hear, um, let's hear about that. Yeah. That's probably good. No, no, no. It, it, my fault. I think it's hunger from like not having enough time to eat so far today. The um, so basically uh, we uh, operate under a variety of deals. Um, generally speaking, we work with first-time indie um, developers that uh, now many of them have worked for other companies before um, or have created games before. But generally speaking, most of them are um, you know uh, new to that. And actually, our Steam publisher page is probably better than the website. I have to admit the website's a bit of a ghost town, so I don't give it the attention it deserves. Um, mm -hmm. but if you if you search Steam publisher hooded horse. Uh, you'll get, I think, the, 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 a good summary of things. So um, there are exceptions, of course. Uh, Old World, developed by Mohawk Games, they're a very well-established um, developer. The, the creative director, Soren Johnson, was the lead designer of Civilization 3 and 4, um, and they'd already been actually out on Epic exclusive before we get, um, started working with them. But most of our games, and actually the one you're seeing right there now, you see Falling Frontier, which uh, all of you must remember from Todd. Um, you know, in one of your prior interviews uh, yeah. being broadcast there. And uh, we've got the little boxes down there that will show you, you know, cycle you through the games. First, we've got the three that we announced at PAX East um, just a couple of days ago, and then we've got the rest. So basically, but our area of publishing is uh, most of our deals um, are indeed where we're sort of, where we're either, some of them, probably about half of them, we're only providing marketing localization because developers didn't need development funding. The other half of them, actually a little more than half, we're providing development funding. Usually it's not 100% of everything that went into the game. Often it's 100% of everything going forward from when we signed. But the thing to remember is, you know, like when we come into a game and it's a year and a half away from release, the developers already been working on that for like two and a half years. They may not have been paying themselves a salary before we got on board, but they there was an implied cost that they put into the game. So when you figure out the implied cost of everything that went into the game before we got to it, um, I would say that we're generally, when we're doing development funding, funding less than half of the project. Um, we're quite often funding every cost going forward from the moment we sign, but in the end, that often works out to be less than half of the project. Um, so we are operating in that area and are, you know, we do provide funding, you know, going forward, which is great and developers appreciate, but I think the primary, um, the primary thing that we offer is the marketing, um, well, localization too, but there's not much interesting to say about that. Uh, we fund translations. Um, the, uh, but in terms of the marketing, um, that is indeed our focus. And, you know, there is, uh, I hesitate to focus, well, let me put it this way. 
I'd be glad to talk to you extensively about marketing throughout this conversation. It, it's a really deep dive into it. I tend to be skeptical yeah. of most publishers' ability to market. So, uh, you know, yeah. it's hard for me to say that that's a benefit of publishers when I actually think most of them do a terrible job. And in fact, in, in, in predictable ways in some case. I mean, you've got, yeah, so let me jump to this. I'll just jump to being, you know, again, doom and gloom on this. But okay. uh, publishers, I think, tend to make very predictable categories of problems in terms of how they market. One is very simple, just total and complete apathy. Uh, and there's more of that than you know you would otherwise imagine. Um, but even when you get past apathy, you also have a lot of opportunistic behavior. So most of the big publishers, indie publishers out there, and most of the smaller ones and most of the mid-sized ones are fundamentally opportunistic. Um, they're looking, they, they're signing a bunch of games, they kind of watch to see which ones are doing well, and then they're going to invest and double down on the games that are doing the best. Yeah. And they're gonna give them the most, yeah, th those are gonna be the ones they feature big in the events. And then the other games, yeah, they'll do a little bit, but not really much. And basically what you're getting there is uh, is something, it, it's basically you're rolling the dice with them to be, if you get one of the, if you're one of the lucky few that they actually help. Now, the interesting thing is I will say, and I'll make little side notes about this. I know it's kind of off topic, but personally, you know, this goes to contract. Just like I think there shouldn't be 100% recoup deals ever in games because I think they're they're just completely destructive developer cash flow and create dependency. Um, I'll also say that I think that the every publishing contract should guarantee that the publisher spend a certain amount. And 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 by that I don't mean like Hollywood accounting expenses internally. I mean actually spend a certain amount marketing and promoting and advertising that game. Um, we've never signed a publishing contract where we don't promise to spend at least one hundred thousand um, dollars. So one hundred thousand is our limit, um, our bottom limit of you know what we promise that we will spend as a minimum on marketing and localization. Um, oftentimes, uh, m many of our deals involve substantially more than that, of course. Uh, but basically, that's you know setting a minimum to where the publisher doesn't even have the option of deciding to play opportunistic games and saying, well, this game's not yeah. doing as well. Yeah, because ultimately the reality is the publisher's portfolio is going to have some games performing better, some games performing worse. Some games will have higher return on investment for ad spend, and some will have lower. That publisher, if they're following their self-interest, will allocate their funds and efforts accordingly. But you really don't want that. I mean, as a developer, you actually want them required to, I mean, frankly, I think there should be like an ethical drive to, to help your games yeah. that are not doing as well. Because, yeah, because I mean, a developer... A developer who signs with a publisher trusts them with something that goes beyond money. It goes something that they've really created, worked hard with. So there should be an ethical drive to do as good for every game, but don't rely on ethical drives. Put a contractual minimum in there where they, at least they have to do these that thing, I'd say. Um, so your you your contract actually says you're going to spend the minimum of that money. Because I've seen publisher so, contracts before that say, we'll do $100,000 worth of marketing. And every time I see that, I'm like, yo, 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 you need to... <laughs> Whatever this is, because that's very different, right? Because I know I used to run a uh, like a marketing company, and I know a hundred thousand dollars of marketing could very easily be, you know, that's it could be three big ads done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, and then not only if you do and it yourself, you know how that expensive you, yeah. you are. Yeah, like you know, thousand yeah. dollars an hour, yeah, that, and like you know, the you're whole right. Deal. Yep. Once you start billing those internal expenses, there's tons of room for mm -hmm. Hollywood accounting. So the, the thing yeah. I'd say about that is we don't like. Like I run, actually, I run our ad campaigns. I'm a former McKinsey and company as consultant. You know, I have all, well, let me knock into that. But um, I, I'm actually really good at the ad analytics side. So I, I run our okay, ad cool. campaigns. No developer gets a bill for my time. Um, you know, when we say we're going to spend this amount, what we're talking is like, you know, this, this amount is going to be spent. It's going to be spent on advertisements, event registration fees, a proportionate cost, of course, because when you enter, like we entered 10 games into PAX East and it was one cost divided among our games. So it's actually pretty cheap. But, um, you know, basically a proportionate cost of event expenses, the localization expenses for the game, um, contractors to do things like produce a trailer. But we're not like we're talking about real expenses that, you know, go to that game and they're dem demonstrable in going to that game. Um, and, and promoting it where it, it's not um, it's not the Hollywood accounting stuff. So that's the first element of what you said is, yeah, you have to you really don't want just like, you know, and, and that's the thing is there's there's another way it just change the perspective on how we're understanding all this. Right. Because a normal publisher has a contract where they say we're going to recoup our expenses. So actually, the contractual term you often see is where they say they put a cap. They say we will bill you up to, you know, 100,000, 200,000, whatever it is in terms of marketing. And you want that number as low as possible. 
because what this right. really means is how much money they're taking before you start to see any money. And it's probably mostly going to disappear into some amorphous Hollywood accounting, whatever that cut, you know, that, that, that publisher's internal costs were. And they just say, well, our marketing department paid this much. Let's go ahead and like start allocating it among games. Um, so you want that number as low as possible. Ours are different partially because we almost never use any recoup terms. Almost the vast majority of our deals are completely flat rates, are completely from the beginning. And our most standard deal is from the beginning. We take 35% of revenue, the developer gets 65% of revenue. Um, it goes up a bit, if, especially if they want, you know, substantial additional development funding. It goes down a bit if they're, you know, if they've done a lot of, you know, sort of things marketing and promoting the game first beforehand and we're coming on to an you know, project and we've got to reflect that by giving them more favorable terms, <laughs> you know, it, 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 but that's sort of like the area it's in. And, and most of our deals are in the range of 35 to 50% flat rate we take. And then the developer gets between 65 and 50% uh, flat rate. But very occasionally a developer wants to desperately keep that flat rate, like five percentage points lower. And they ask us, could we do some sort of limited recoup? And so we have you know, for instance, we have a deal where we have 35% of the revenue long term, but we get an additional 15% initially that goes towards recouping certain defined costs. And that was really only because the developer preferred that to a 40% flat rate, because I would have, you know, probably preferred a 40% flat rate. I prefer the simplicity. So in our case, um, the marketing, it's, it's basically rather than being a threat, when we put a number there on marketing. It's actually a promise. It's, it's sort of a, a guarantee for it. You know, we we say we will spend a minimum of a hundred thousand. Again, that's not you know that's actual real expenses that go towards it, right. and that can do a lot for a game. I mean, usually, I mean, it, it's it's. I mean, it, it, it advertising is an interesting thing, right? And not all of it's advertising. A lot of it's event participation, um, uh, you know, localization and such. But um, advertising is one of those things that you know, as you, we spend a lot of time refining how we approach it. We're, you know, generally, I mean, it, it's we've gotten good to where I usually can average around a dollar per wish list um, in advertising our games on Steam, which is, uh, I think, quite good um, and is worthwhile for the developers as well. Yeah. Uh, it, advertising is a dangerous area to get into if you don't know what you're doing because you can easily lose a lot of Absolutely. your money. Yeah. And, and especially you work for a marketing. Agent. I mean, you know, you said it yourself. The easiest thing in the world is to burn money in advertising. Like, you know, if we just were like, OK, we got to burn 50,000 in advertising. I can do that. Like, you know, we can do that in a couple it's weeks. so much so that I yeah. tell all indies to stay away from it because you can right. burn, like and not only that, yeah. but there's so many like vanity metrics, right? Like people be like, oh, I got 500 yeah. likes for my $500. Yes. And it's like, dude, you <laughs> That's not going to yeah. work for you. But you know what's worse yeah. is that there's a lot of publishers and there's a lot of marketers that will, they know that these people uh, value those vanity metrics, don't mean anything. And so they deliver it to them like it means something. Yes. Like a friend yeah. of mine got a report back from a marketing company that they hired and like, we got you 6.5 million impressions. And he was like super excited about like 6.5 million impressions. And I'm like, dude, like that doesn't, like <laughs> that's. <laughs> How many sounds did you Go through Nothing. the details. Yeah, exactly. Like it yeah. doesn't mean anything. Those are like bullshit numbers that like yes. just yeah. So um it's really refreshing to hear from somebody like you who's actually like going through this stuff and and fighting for the indie developer because I, yeah. I think we need more people like that, you know. Like there's so much misleading stuff out there, especially yeah. in the publisher world where the, these yeah. indies trust these people because they're supposed to know what they're do, doing and right i've, but, I've got, a, yeah. got a question for you tim uh we've got a mostly a room full of beginner hobbyist uh beginner to intermediate hobbyist indie game developers people who are aspiring to get there and they're working on a game uh you know in the background and they're thinking well it'd be cool one day if my game got published and made some money that would be neat so uh, for folks who are in that early stage of the journey, they haven't been working necessarily on their game for four years and have it look amazing and polished and kind of ready to go. What, how would you, what words of wisdom would you give to those folks to guide them with whatever they're working on at the moment so it gets to the point where they can have a conversation with someone like yourself from Hooded Horse and say, oh, here we go, let's do a publishing deal. What, what sort of things would you say to the folks you know, earlier in their journey that makes it useful mm -hmm. from a publisher perspective? Yeah. So if, if it's all right, I will real quickly respond to Tim's uh, last point and then I'll get okay. right on that. Right? Uh, apologies yeah. for jumping over over Tim. Sorry, Tim. No, no, no I, I, not at all. Thank I just you. want to make sure I don't drop any. There are two points. Tims now, Rick. It's confusing me, man. That's why. I, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, 
Yeah, so I, Tim, on your point, yeah, so when we're currently running like an active ad campaign at pretty, you know, good levels, and I'll, I'll say right now, we're running an ad campaign for our game Old World, which is releasing on May 19th. So it's, you know, four weeks away from release, this is very close, which means this is the time when we really heat up ads. I'm spending three hours a day optimizing those campaigns, staring at it, adjusting bids, changing targeting, redoing ads, analyzing the conversion. That it is just as much work. Like basically, if you were actually looking like a financial, if we spend fifty thousand on ads, I'm basically spending fifty thousand of my time. It just doesn't get billed to anyone. Um, you know, uh, just doing everything I can to make those things efficient, and that's the only way. It, it's basic, and that's even using everything we've learned from our prior, you know, ad campaigns. It, it is an intensive effort in order to do it. Um, and you know that's the thing is it's why it's so easy to spend money and waste it because you don't have to commit any staff time you just basically put it up there put some ads and you're done if you want it to run well it's hours and hours a day um and and you know in particular in old world i will say it's it's you know it's gaining between a thousand to two thousand wish lists a day every day um we're spending less than that in dollars so i'm quite confident that we're getting the efficient results for it but it it, it takes an intense amount of work um and it's also something that quite frankly you actually have to it's a particular skill. It's not something that yeah. most indie should delve in. And the final point is, honestly, advertising is not something to delve in unless you've got it. I mean, look, we, we do 100,000 as our minimum commitments because you need mass amounts of money to do this. If I tried to do a $10,000 ad campaign for a game, it would, you know, it, yeah. it would not be worth it. Yeah, because you're just, you're you you, spent $10,000. You need enough money to lose to figure out what works. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah it, it, it's there and it's just, you know, I mean, the scale of effort at scales over how much you can spend. So, yeah, it, it, it's not really ads are not the way for Indies. I do not think you can run small ad campaigns. Sure. It's less of that, mm -hmm. But frankly, it's a lot of time investment and so easy to lose your money. So with that, I'll now go on to Rick's point, unless there's a follow up, Tim. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, it makes sense at your scale, too, because you're the other thing that Indies don't get is that you running advertising campaigns on games that are unproven to have demand is even riskier because you don't know if your ads are working or the game's not working, right? But once yes. you know that, hey, like this game converts pretty decently, people are interested in it, then it makes more sense to do an ad campaign because at least you know like the yeah. hook works for a certain type of audience. Yeah. But yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's um, completely good. agreed on that. And I think that, yeah. you know, I mean, ultimately I will say this, ads are not our primary driver of, you know, uh, marketing for any game. They're a minor component, I'd say 20% or less. Um, the other components of so steam optimization is probably the dominant thing that just, you know, is most influential influencers are out there. Press is really, you know, press is very useful. It's, it's obviously doesn't drive to as many consumers as, as influencers does now, but you know, I mean, it's great to work with great journalists and it's really wonderful to see articles about the game. Uh, but basically ads are a very small component. I mean, honestly, if, if you told me right now, we, we couldn't run any ads at all, um, that would be fine. Our games would do 80% as well as they do now. It would be, you know, like not even that noticeable. Uh, and, and some of the marketing budget I put there, that's not all into ads. Again, that, that's a marketing and localization budget. We have a hundred thousand floor for that. A lot is spent on localization because that allows you to reach new audiences. Um, in particular Chinese, um, both traditional and simplified. We do Japanese uh, people are, don't understand actually the degree to which Japanese gamers, people still have this attitude that Japanese gamers are console gamers, which just isn't true. Uh, Japanese is, is, is probably our, our number two most important localization behind Chinese. Really? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I could get into that. That I'll get into later in this conversation if you like, but I feel bad if I leave Rick's point too long. So- um, <laughs> You're waiting. It's, it's <laughs> every, what happens every week, my friend. I'm, I'm the kicking boy. I'm the whipping boy, I don't know, kicking dough, whatever it is, kick me. Yeah. <laughs> So it's um, so what I would say is I, I agree with you that as an indie, I would leave ads alone because frankly, even at, at the scale and experience we have with ads, it's still only a minor component of what goes on. And frankly, there's so much room to optimize and work on every other aspect of marketing um, that I just I don't think it's now there are the occasional exceptions because you'll get everyone has different talents and you'll find the occasional indie dev who like really loves adjusting bid numbers and understands exactly right. how to like you know count those things and maybe that guy should should do it because he's got a special talent but other than that um anyway okay so on on to that so rick um the uh in terms of getting publishers to be interested in the game so i can talk i can talk about my impressions of what gets other publishers interested which is somewhat different than what gets me interested so okay. first i'll do it very quick but me is less important for most people um, for one thing, we are, you know, we we have Hooded Horse has a particular scope, which I actually think is, is important for a publisher. We publish strategy, simulation, and role-playing games. Now that includes a lot of things. Roguelikes are often quite strategic. 
um, the, uh, you know, like, well, Sons of Valhalla playing right there. This is, this is a game that, you know, we love and fits our portfolio. You know, you build little bases, you fight, you gather your men and stuff. But basically, we are strategy simulation in RPGs, which means that we don't do first person shooters or, um, you know, if we did a platformer, I guess you could in some sense call Sons of Valhalla, it's a 2D side scroller, but it's got those elements, those strategic and RPG elements. So we're actually somewhat limited. So I imagine most of your audience is probably not making the sort of game that we publish. Not that there is, I'm sure there are some who are, but just, you know, it's the reality of anybody who's got a limited scope is, is most people aren't that. So what I do is probably less important to people, but I will quickly say just for reference. So with us, um, the most important thing is that the game is doing something that some amount of players can fall in love with. And that's um, you know true of every game in our portfolio. Like we don't we don't look and say, okay, is this game a proven success because it resembles another game? Which is what a lot of well, I'll get into the other publishers in a second. Mm -hmm. But basically, our approach is that we're we're focused on is it doing something in such a way that there's something there for some group of people to absolutely love. And and, and is that subjective? That, that's you saying mm, this looks pretty cool, or is that based upon uh, you know there's a demo out there and people are raving about it? What's the it, yeah, just how subjective versus um, quantifiable is it? Well, I mean, the thing is we have, it's not that I don't look at numbers if they're out there, but we also sign games that have, that are fundamentally, uh, you know, new um, to, to, to players and haven't shown that yet. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you look at our PAX East announcements, um, you've got one that was actually doing quite well, um, Sons of Valhalla, um, which, you know, was do doing pretty well on, on Steam without us. Um, and but we also fell in love with it. But you've also got two new games we announced, Espiocracy and Capital Command, that were, you know, I mean, basically those, those you know, they, they were very, you know, relatively unknown on Steam. So, you know, th these are games that did not, that had a couple thousand wish lists. Um, and, you know, I mean, frankly, we, you know, with, with the, uh, w with these games, I mean, in the last, like, in the last couple of days, each of them has gotten like several thousand additional wishes because of PAX East and all of the announcement stuff. So basically, these are games that we're, we're basically just starting with. And frankly, actually, I should say this. We don't have to talk in abstracts. If you want to know how a game is doing in numbers, and this is actually gets to the conversation later about how publishers tend to look at games, all you do, do is pull up SteamDB. So if you go to SteamDB.com, and actually, let's take a look at a couple of games, actually. If, if Rick, do you, do, you, do you want to show this? I'll talk you through it. Um, so if you go to... This, this will be interesting, perhaps, to, to some of the audience, although a lot of them will know. So steamdb.com, exactly that one. So now we can search for any game. So um, what you'll be able to do is, uh, well, I don't know why it's, huh. This What's is for it doing? sale. <laughs> is it a different URL? Hey, is it do you want, should we buy it now, Tim? Is that what we should do? <laughs> Get it. I think GoDaddy's selling it. <laughs> probably have the URL on. I tell you, Google search Steam. Be and and uh, yeah. let's do Fallen Frontier. You know Todd's game that you had on previously. That might be it. So, oh, um, info. Um, that info it info. Yeah, that's it. So <laughs> now search for any game you like. So search for Fallen Frontier, which is you know Todd's game from that you guys interviewed a bit. No, fall, falling actually. So uh, falling. yeah, you know I I mess it up every single time. Fall there was an old <laughs> game called that. I think it was a canceled project. So Falling Frontier is the perfect example. I'm going to show you a couple of extremes of a game that did not fundamentally need us as a publisher. Um, if you click charts, so it's over there on the left-hand side. There you go. Um, and now scroll down a bit because concurrent players means nothing for an release game. Now, the th there you are. Perfect. That's the perfect view. So I will say that first, never compare games that are released to unreleased games in terms of follower count. A follower count for a released game means something totally different. Um, for an unreleased game, though, follower count is a very good proxy for wishlist. In fact, you basically know how many wishlists the game has. The wishlist number will generally be seven to ten times the follower count. So, you know, in this case, you can basically know that. Well, I mean, I'm bad at math, and I actually do know the real numbers. Was so how accurate it is so forty four. So it's so. somewhere between three hundred and four hundred thousand wishlists, if I understood your numbers correctly. You're multiplying yes. by seven to ten. So we could just multiply by ten yep. to get the upper bound, four hundred and fifty thousand ish, uh, and then. It, it, yep. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, so the more excited basically the player base is the the more it will tend towards seven and the sort of right. less excited the player base is the more it'll tend to, towards 10 relative to yes. basically, basically relative to a game with that number of followers how excited they are so falling for tier will be more to the lower bound so you basically um it's a it, it's a little bit above the lower bound of course that you just named so it, it, it's um i don't think todd will mind he said it um but basically um anyway this is all public data okay i'm not going to say the real number but anyway it's okay. it's it's in there 
Um, yeah, you, so, could just, you just say higher, lower as we guess it. Is it 300, no, 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 no. warmer, colder? <laughs> like, no, no, no. All sorts I, I, of contractual Todd, things you're breaking. I could be watching right now. I got, yeah, I got yeah, to watch. No. Yeah, no, so anyway, the, but, but no, the point is I'm not sharing anything confidential because the, these, yeah. these ranges are actually well known, um, the seven yeah. to 10 times. So a game is within seven to 10 times the number of followers uh, in terms of wish list. And Falling Frontier is very exciting to its audience. So it tends to go yeah. to a little bit lower. Games that are a little bit um, less engaged uh, with the audience. And, and that's simply because people hit both wish list and follow. The people who double click, basically, it's, it's almost like a double liking the game when you also click follow. The other thing is if there is a lot of proportion of wish list coming from events, which people sometimes wish list from the event page, it'll skew the ratio up. But actually, sorry, if you could bring back the chart, I actually did want to dive into the how to understand it. So this is basically the model of a game. Like you can actually, you know, basically this is the model of a game that was before we signed publishing was already going up steadily, right? And it's it's true that when we signed publishing, you see that basically if you we signed publishing around, um, you know, May, uh, we actually started marketing around May of 2021. So you'll see things do turn upwards and start going. So quite all a of this is you guys got it. No, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't tease. I, I shouldn't tease. I know Todd's watching and yeah, I, I understand. It's common. It would have done well without it. Yeah. yeah. We helped it go faster is what I'm saying. Yeah. But if you yeah. notice it before we got on board, you can easily guess that this is a game that had 60,000 wish lists before we got on board because you can yeah. basically see where it was in, 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 in its follower account. Yeah. Um, so it was going to do fine. It was going to keep going up. We made it go faster, but this game was going to do fine. And, you know, for context, this game was going to launch in the top 100 most wishlisted upcoming games on Steam, no problem, um, you know, without us. If you And this is one that we got on after people already knew, knew it was doing well. Now, if we contrast it with another game, like one of the ones recently signed, if let's search, um, let's search, uh, uh, let's search uh, Espiocracy. Yeah, it's it, this is just pointing out I haven't updated the website. Uh, <laughs> I, I got to confess. Websites are basically ghost towns. I've got they, my website designer are. doing it, but I spend it's, almost all of our time on our YouTube and Steam publisher. It's like the 10 people a day who visit our webpage or just, you know, it's anyway. But if you go back to the, the Steam, uh, yeah, and you search for uh, Espiocracy, so E S P I O, uh, which might be enough for it to guess what you want. So it's there, the third one. Yeah. Yep. There I, you go. I, did, I did jump back here to try to find the spelling because I, I didn't want to mess that oh, up. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's sort of an odd name. And hit charts again. Yeah, and then you scroll down. Well, so this is a, yeah. So this is a game that, as you see, like the way it turns upwards from us getting involved is much sharper. Yeah. And before we got involved, not and and let me be clear about something. This is a great game with huge potential, absolutely yeah. huge. Potential. We, we're very excited about this game, but it's it's not like Todd's that it was already soaring up the charts. And anyone who's like a chart watching publisher, which a lot of them are, and that's how they select games, would look at this game and say, "Yeah, it's not doing. You know, th this isn't one to contact." But what by looking into it and if yeah. you look at i mean pull up its steam page if you like there's something to love here it's a game that's going in you know it's a strategy game that says what if we let you choose to run any intelligence agency in the world starting at the end of the uh, at, at the end of um world war ii and beginning of the cold war and just run to 2020 and it's basically it's an espionage strategy game which cool. exists in board games right you got games like twilight imperium and such but there is no video game like this so this is what I mean by something to love about the game. There is no video game that actually lets players do this. The player sits themselves and says, I want to play, I want to run intelligence agency. I want to play spy games on it. You know, there's no game that's going to let them do it this way. So this is, this is something to love, basically. It's something that, and Falling Frontier, of course, has something to love too. The only difference is people had already started seeing what there was to love Falling Frontier before we got on board. Um, yeah. But we're not we're not limiting ourselves to when other people have already seen what there is to love. We're, we're going out and finding the ones that really just, you know, I mean, we're, we're mine. Basically, for us in talking to a game and whether we publish it, it really doesn't matter if it's unknown before. It. I mean, the fact that SBIocracy didn't have a bunch already built up, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't cause us to doubt there's something to do here. The only difference it does is we gave Todd. I mean, frankly, we gave him a slightly better deal because he'd already built up marketing presence. And there's no reason not to give him a somewhat better deal. Then yep. because yep. It rewards what he did, but you know it's uh, it's not a reason that would stop us from looking at a game. Um, and by the same so, token, we get hit all the. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask, like, so for publishing games, are you looking for 
games that have strong kind of hooks and uniqueness to them? Or are you also okay with like tried and true versions of a genre, like a 4X or a strategy? Like if they're a good version of that game or do they have to have something unique and interesting about them that no other game has? I honestly think that when something is a, a great game in the genre, which means it has a great designer who loved that game, there's going to be things unique about it. I actually think it doesn't happen that you just have like, okay, it's like every other game or it's like the prior games. Because if it really is that, actually it won't excite players much. And, you know, a great designer isn't going to think, I just want to do like this game. But, you know, like the, the, the games that are unexciting to me are games that are like game X, but why? You know, like, it's just like, okay, so let me take this and, let me, and I'm going to take this exact game formula and I'm going to make it about vampires. And now I'm going to take the exact same formula and I'm going to make it about, you know, uh, surviving the end of the world. And yes, I am talking about Playway Games, which is the worst offender in this category. Um, so uh, Mr. Prepper and their vampire version of it and everything. Do you know anything about Playway Games? Am I, am I you know, being the... No. So this is a, it's a Polish publisher that basically they've got a ton of well-performing games on Steam. And look, none of them, if, if people enjoy those games but they basically make the same game 10 times over with 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 slight changes um and that that's their approach and uh the uh yeah and, and they're monstrously big i mean you're talking about and look i you know i'm not well okay let me put it this way i i don't have particular warm feelings for this company considering i particularly saw a particular great indie game by an actual you know great indie developer called manor lords which is doing great on steam and uh, basically carbon copied that game uh, to try to basically do what mobile games do, fast follows. And if you pull up Manor Lords on Steam, which you should, this game is amazing, you'll see at the bottom like this personal note from the developer of Manor Lords about how he takes all feedback seriously, being a solo developer and stuff. Playway even copied that personal note um, as well as they copied how his road building works and basically everything about it. And they dressed themselves up and pretended to be a solo developer. And the this is the real game, the real game from the great indie developer. And scroll down, you'll even see the note I'm talking about. Um, so wow. you know, you, you got, yeah, this is this is a great game, and you've got these note handcrafted down there, personal message. Um, now go look up a game called Viking City Builder, um, because uh, you will then see, you know, what I'm talking about. And this is the Playway game, except it won't say it's Playway. For the most part, Playway hides its identity. It's, it claims to be from a solo developer named Ross Logan. Actually, if you look up the corporate address of Ross Logan, its registered address, you'll find it's the same as Playway's offices. So um, are they a development house too? Playway is a Playway is a publisher, but I think they own developers. And in fact, I think in most of their publishing deals, they claim like equity ownership over majority control for oh, the developer. Wow. Not known for developer friendly terms, as you can imagine, from a publisher that sees a great indie game coming up and decides, let me copy that as close as you can. Take a look at the road building too. The road building is like an exact, I mean, if you look at Manor Lord's road building GIF and you compare it to that Viking City Builders, I mean, it, it's amazing the extent. I mean, there's actually been YouTube. You could look at YouTube videos calling this out and talking about how Playway is clearly copying a developer here. You know, um, I have seen are, Thief Simulator and House Flipper on the, the top of the Switch bestsellers constantly. Yeah. They're yep, always they do. And they're always exploiting the sales systems too, because the Thief Simulator yep. is like 99% off or whatever. So it they sell most units, and then the the, the switch things go by units, not by um, dollars made. So they end up on the yep, top. There, yeah, there you are at the road building. See, see that right there? How they show the road building in Playways copy and the original in Manor Lords. I mean, they're they're even at that level with that. Um, dude, the yeah, icon is the same. Oh my god! Do they they're, have the they're dude with the plowing the field though, because that for me is the star of the show. <laughs> they haven't copied that. I like then. it too. They, they, they missed what. Yep, they couldn't help but dress it up in their own stuff. But, you know, the amazing thing is actually if you go into the comments there, you'll have this Russ Logan talking about how he's a solo developer, responding to things that, I mean, look, I, I, I'm not going to dig into this more. It's it's not my, you can find tons of articles about this, including actually I should mention from Simon Carlos wrote a good article on Playways marketing methods, which is basically, uh, he tried to be as objective as possible to talk about what they're doing clever that indie devs could potentially learn from. Um, as well as also talk about the sort of the, the, the downsides. And if anyone would like to look that up, it's I think it's what Playway can teach us. Um, actually, we could probably find it here, but it's from Simon Carlos, who I should say, if you, if anyone in the audience is looking for just a great game marketing resource to subscribe to, Simon Carlos's Game Discover Co. newsletter is really just absolutely great. Um, yeah. 
So it's uh, yeah, Game Discover Co. Um, so it's all one word. It's game. Actually, there it is. You got it. So um, that that's I highly recommend everyone subscribe to this. Um, so it's uh, yeah. So anyway, th th this is this is a very good resource. So there's plenty of things if anyone wants to go down the rabbit hole, play where you've got YouTube videos where YouTubers compare the trailers of those two games and show how you know it was copied. You've got all sorts of a mess, but. The main thing is the point is there is um, there are companies like Playway that they are very much about like game X with Y or see what works well and then do it five times over, um, which is prevails in the mobile space particularly. But they're to some degree bringing those methods to PC. I don't. That's very much the opposite of of what we like to do. Is that what we're we're about? Is that it's um, it, it's there's there's something innovative. Something that just changes it up with each game that we do. I could describe things about it that are just you know different than any other game. It's trying new ground, and I think that's what developers do. You know, great developers and great designers do is they confront. If you fall in love with your game, you're going to leave your personal stamp on it. I actually don't think it's possible to just sort of like create the sort of soulless copy from one to the other and do a good job because you know if, if you love it, if which games require love to really be great, then then you're going to introduce innovation. So. So what we're looking at just now was some games that already looked like they had followers and therefore already had wish lists and had some degree of readiness on Steam. Um, just at, at what exact point is it too early for you to consider something? To, to let me let me be very specific about this. At what point are you open to having a conversation with a developer who's working on something? Now yep. I'm, I'm assuming I've got an idea is way too early. Uh, unless that person's had 10 successful games in track record. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm guessing, oh, my game launched seven years ago and it's kind of dead in the water. It might be a little bit after the event. At, at what point are you saying, here's the sweet spot where we'd love to talk to you just here? Oh, Yeah, and, I, and by the way, quiet. I glanced over at the chat and noticed there's a question about the Christmas tree. It's like the first thing I've looked over at the chat and noticed. So I will explain. Um, I, I, I've been very neglectful in taking on the Christmas tree so my wife moved it into my office, figuring that I would definitely take it down if it were there in view of my, uh, you know, the voice calls I did. This is my home office right here where I am. Um, that hasn't happened yet. I hope it will happen soon. Um, the uh, it's, and apologies if I'm ignoring any questions in the chat. I'm actually not good at multitasking and looking at it. That's the only one I've seen. So far. <laughs> it's, all, it's um, okay. I had some people saying my microphone is quiet. Just let me know. I've tweaked it. Let me know if it's okay. Is it okay for you guys? Sounds yeah. good now. Oh, yeah, cool. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so Tim, yeah. Where, where's the sweet spot for people to say, knock, 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 Tim, I've got this thing I'm working on. Yeah, so we've had, um, you know, with uh, Terra Invicta, which was the first game we announced, it did not have a Steam page before we got on board. In fact, it was uh, quite a bit after we started publishing. Um, I'd have to look up the exact dates, but I think it was many months, could have been almost a year uh, um, that we actually put the Steam page up. Yeah, I think it was actually almost a year. Um, and we, uh, we noticed them because I was a fan of their prior work. They were modders. They created a mod called the long war, uh, for XCOM. And, um, I played that mod and liked it and I was on their newsletter. And so I got news of Terra Invicta when it was early on and contacted them and basically said, let's get involved. So that one we were, you know, basically it was a year before it was there. There was a game for them to show me in unity. It wasn't particularly playable. Um, like it was a long way from being you know, ready at that time. It was still a year before we went from that to their Kickstarter and launched the Steam page. Um, you know, we basically signed them about a year before. So it was, a, a, you know, it was it, it was an early stake, but they could show me around in Unity and they could say, hey, look at this, look at this, here's what we plan to do. And you know, it's more than just someone's idea, as you said, it, it's, they're, they're actually working on that thing. Um, so I think that that's, 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 that, that's what is the stage for us, which is, Someone can actually show us around something and talk to us about it. And they're already sort of working on it well on their way. And we're good at telling the difference. Like we're good at knowing like what's the roughness of like a game and development and what's the, uh, and, and what means there's actually some complexity and some, some, some thought and interesting things going on with that. Um, so that all having been said, um, let me take a step back from us, because again, I think that we're, our, our approach, I mean, let me put it this way of the 10 games we've currently signed, not a single one ever showed us a pitch deck. Um, so that is not going to be typical for most publishers. Most publishers, right. you do the whole song and dance. Here's my pitch deck. It's like you're going to some VCs or something and, you know, all that. None of them actually showed us a pitch deck of the ones we signed. There's someone showed us picked that we didn't find. Not that we have anything against pitch decks. Just worked out. My point is that we're, I'm very, I'm, 
I think my approach in some ways, I'm very comfortable just sitting them and having them show me Unity scenes and, and chat about it. Um, the uh, So going to how to get, if you're, and again, presuming that you don't have prior successful games. If prior successful games, you don't need my advice on any of this anyway. So um, you, do you the, think uh, that's really good enough to get in the door most places having a... Yeah. There's there's a lot of money floating around the game industry right now, especially in the in okay. recent years. And there's that money is looking for things that money can understand. Um, so what that money can understand is past success. Uh, you know, basically what you have to understand is that most people with money to throw around, whether in publishers or any of this sort of alternative investment house or whatever's going on right now, um, they actually don't. I mean, I'm going to be mean here, but I, I don't think they understand the vast majority of games they, they consider. What they're looking for is something that makes sense to them in their own ways of looking at it. What makes sense to them often is some numbers they can point to. And if that's you correct number, you can do it again kind of deal. I think that's a lot of it. Yeah. So okay. basically, developers who've had a really successful game find it's really easy to get money. In fact, they find they can go before publishers and have the publishers say, oh, you only want a million? What would happen if we gave you two million? Uh, what could you do then? Uh, because there is a lot of money floating around games. Uh, the thing is, that's it's it's easy to the the past success makes it an easy call for them in some ways. And I think part of it is that they're able to understand it. And the other part is, I mean, frank, frankly, I mean, you ever heard the expression "no one ever got fired for 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 buying an IBM"? You know, back in the days of IBM mainframes, it's not even about whether this is the best deal or the best quality. But if you're the guy who's supposed to pick the mainframe computer to buy. Um, you know, you're not going to get fired if you pick an IBM. Everyone's going to understand that. If you're the guy who picks the game that was made by the prior successful developer and it doesn't work out, no one's firing you for that. Uh, it's part of the reason why there's so much money put into some things that don't work in marketing too within publishers, I think. You know, they spend a lot of money on things that have very questionable returns, like gigantic convention displays that are like, <laughs> they probably spent 100000 on there and there's just really no measurable return coming from that except some show of like, look how much money we have to burn and set on fire. Um, but no one ever got fired for stuff like that. So. I think that in the end, you'll find that if you have a prior successful game, it's relatively, you know, easy compared to anything else to find publishers interested. If you have, do you, oh, sorry, think, do you think the opposite is true? So, like, if you if you have a prior game that didn't do well, do you think that hurts you, or not really? I mean, I think you're probably a leg up from someone who doesn't have a game ship. Um, okay. Especially so just showing that you can ship is actually bonus points. I think that's probably true. Um, I think that's probably true. Again, I'm inferring from to some degree from other publishers. I would definitely see it as a positive um, because it's some demonstration of ability. And quite frankly, I mean, the uh, well, here's the thing: if you're pitching the sequel to a game that didn't sell, forget it. Um, no one wants to do that. If you're pitching a game that's similar to a game that didn't sell, I mean, personally, I would still be interested. But I think a lot of publishers wouldn't be because they would think, okay, this proved the market doesn't work. There's this strangely sort of like um, game i mean okay there's this attitude good games sell themselves i think most people here probably realize that isn't the case uh strangely right. enough you'll find some of the heart you know some of the the bastion of believing that statement you'll find within the way many publishers operate even if they won't say it themselves but certainly when they're talking to developers it's all about we have the golden key we'll sell your game and make it succeed but they operate in a way that almost believes that in that you know like they'll go they'll not really market a game not really put effort into it it will not be doing that well, and they'll never ask. Well, maybe we weren't doing the right approach. Um, yeah. We actually, and like you said earlier, they put money into the ones that do better by default. Yes. So it's when, when in of, reality, yeah. yeah. When in reality, a lot of I mean, there's a lot of games out there that could have succeeded if something had been different in marketing. Um, so that all having been said, it's you know safest to to, to, pitch, to pitch something other than what you know if you're going to another publisher who probably will think this was fate or this was the nature of the game to pitch something that looks different. Um, that all having been said, I think that you're going to have trouble getting the kind of publisher you'd want to sign with if you've not had a prior success. If you've had a big prior success, you can go to the publishers um, that are pretty much, you know, pretty good, that, that that are really just the top. The top of the industry publishers are generally pretty good. Now, quite frankly, half of them exhibit that kind of opportunistic behavior we're talking about. Um, but at least they're somewhat competent. Um, and Do you have a uh, quantifiable success like level like are we talking ftl crazy runaway success or are we talking like north of 20k or like you know what are we any idea i think it's probably a sliding scale where where the better it does the better deals you'll find 
the more reception you'll find. Um, that all having been said, I really, I, I, I think a first time developer is going to have an extremely hard time. Whatever they say in, in tweets that they put out there, where they say, we welcome submissions for developers of all sizes and situations, um, which maybe they do, and sometimes it will happen. But oftentimes, if you're a first time developer and you're out there pitching something that has not already shown success on Steam, you're gonna get, you're gonna find that the publishers that you might wanna work with aren't really returning your calls and the hordes and hordes of endless fly-by-night new publishers that do absolutely nothing for their games and have no confidence um, are going to be eager to sign you and are going to be, uh, you know, they, they write emails the same way, right? It starts like this. Um, we have X number of years of combined experience across industry leaders, such as, you know, uh, A, B, and C, naming, you know, various top companies. Uh, we, Steam is very hard, but we have the experience to give you the, the, and it goes on, right? I mean, these are the kind of emails that you're going to get constantly. Um, it's, uh, there are way too many publishers out there trying without any confidence at all. There are very, very few publishers that know how to confidently market a game. And the vast majority of indie developers are capable of marketing their game better than the vast majority of publishers. If for no other reason, then they actually know what their game is. And that's a point I really do want to stress. Consistently, when I've seen bad marketing from publishers, it's because they're trying to shove that game, they're trying to shove that you know square peg of a game into a round hole. They're, they're trying, and, and that round hole is selected because that is something that sold a lot, and they think sold a lot. I've seen, you know, and I have conversations with indie developers all the time, even when we wouldn't really do their game, if they reach out, I'm often, you know, just hop on and chat with them and give them advice. And I've seen some with like, you know, current publishers even have reached out and I've talked to them or like, you know, their publisher dropped them because it wasn't working well and I've talked to them. And invariably the Steam page is not what it should be because it's not what the game is. It's not what's special about the game. It's instead trying to make that game look like something that that publisher believes is mass market. Um, and it that really doesn't work. Uh, you know, go ahead. Can I ask Tim, uh, if someone's looking to contact you, they've got a game they're working on or worked on they're looking to get your attention, you know, you're, you're a good dude. And if someone's like, Hey, I watched you on a stream, maybe you'd be like, Oh, okay, let's have a chat. But in general, if someone's cold contacting you with no context, what do they need to show or say in that first connection for you to see that through the sea of other stuff that you get contacted with, how to stand out to actually get your attention for that very first contact? So I will say that I try to respond to everyone and including ones that are not appropriate games for us to publish. I try to write them back and just say, hey, the game looks great. Uh, I wish you great success. It's really not within our, our, our focus um, you, because we'll get first person shooters pitched to us like multiplayer only first person shooters, which frankly, I wouldn't be good at marketing. Like there's a you know, we, we, we've got our range of things that we can do pretty well. Um, but so it's uh, I think I look at everything that comes in. Um, sometimes I can be a little slow. Sometimes it can take me a week or two to respond, but I try to respond to everything. Um, and most of those come into, you know, I mean, if, if anyone wants to talk to me, honestly, especially if you want to submit a game for publishing, you can send it to publishing at hoodedhorse.com. But if you want to just talk to me casually, because I mean, maybe your game isn't even in our genres, but you just want to chat and get advice about something, um, you can come find me in our Discord, um, which, you know, just, you know, find the Hooded Horse Discord. You've got a link of it on our Hooded Horse Twitter. Um, Hooded Horse Inc. is at Hooded Horse Inc. is our Twitter, and you've got a Discord link there. Join the Discord, send me a private message. Um, I'm Hooded Horse there. Uh, just, you know, that, that's my Discord handle. Um, send me a private message, and I will be glad to chat with you and take a look at things. Um, even if it's, and to be clear, not with the necessary publishing. Uh, it doesn't have to be a conversation about publishing. It can literally just be, I'll, I'll, I'll chat. I mean, it's, I love indie games where I'm doing this, so I'm always happy to chat. Um, now, in terms of communication and 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 what looks good to us, I mean, I, I've told you, I've indicated before, slide decks, I don't really, you know, have much concern for. They're usually like, you know, like, here's a slide of a bunch of happy, smiling team members pretending that they're not incredibly tired because they're working on developing the game all the time, followed by a slide that's like, this is how well our game will perform. And it's like the top expectation is like the blowout success of that genre. And the like disappointing, you know, worst case scenario is like still a huge success. And, you know, it's, uh, and it's, yeah. it's just, it's, you know, I, I don't know what one gets from that. So they're um, kind of archaic. Like they don't, they don't make sense. Like they're designed for pitching a room full of people that don't know what the hell a game is. Like, yeah. look what it can do. It's a thing. 
but anyone that knows anything about the industry can clearly tell like this has potential yes. this doesn't yeah 100 percent agreement I, I will say that i know a ton of publishers like to see slide deck so I'm, I'm really not saying you shouldn't reach out for slide deck for for me in particular it won't matter um but a lot of publishers no, i think like that's a benefit to you though is that you the stupid oh, tradition <laughs> that exists you're like no that's yeah. dumb we don't do that you're, you're the exception yeah. and because uh, exactly. I, I, like, of... I like that conversations that, that's true yeah. it's it's um but yeah it's 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 honestly it's the game it's it's you know seeing what the game is um that's that that's what gets exciting and then i think just just on that point tim i think it's it's tricky as well because there'll be some people in the room if you're pitching to a publisher or you know a group of individuals an investor for example there might be someone in the room whose role is different to like indie game expert so here's the indie game expert guy here's the guy who's out there trying to you know knock on doors and get money here's the person who's keeping the company afloat here's the person who's whatever you know runs the building and so you have these people in there like I kind of don't know how to see if this is a good game or not. So I think sometimes in those meetings, people are like, can you, can you tell the guy who doesn't know what he's doing? Like, can you give him some information? So he's happy, just show us some, some good looking images. And then that guy's, Oh, that looks good. Okay. So I think yeah. there's a little, and it sounds that cool. Right. You're having conversation, like you're super deep. You know, exactly what's you can, you can smell it. That game's going to do well. That game's got further to go. I think some of those publisher conversations, it's tough to know how do I talk to the guy who kind of isn't an expert in this You're field. Right. So just anyone's yeah. listening, you know, I not think, everyone's as I awesome think, as Tim when it comes to knowing, you know, how to help you with your game. Well, I, yeah, it's and you look, my team is also um, similar. I mean, I recruited a team that's sort of like me in a lot of ways, right? So, like, you know, I mean, if you if you look at my team that actually looks because we all look about and talk to the games or in, in our Discord, our private, you know, staff Discord, but you know. Um, I mean, I, I've got a bunch of YouTubers and Twitch streamers who work for me. That's like my marketing department. Um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, H, um, H for Havoc on YouTube, Cormacker TV on Twitch, Barely Tactical on Twitch. Th these guys are my, you know, like the Twitch streamers and, and YouTubers who play our games are actually, that's the entirety of the marketing department. So that, you know, helps because you're basically talking to people who all want to see the same thing. We're all just interested in the game and yeah. whether we fall in love with the game. And that's... I think it's a good approach and frankly it's working well for us i mean it's um i mean well anyway i'll, I'll refrain from bragging um the uh about how well our games are doing instead jump to the the um the the, the sort of other publisher conversation. so i think with other publishers here's here's what i would do if i were an indie developer is i would um i would i, I would basically focus initially on marketing my game um myself and to be perfectly frank I probably would never sign with a publisher because I'm probably only going to get interest from the kind of publishers that would be worthy of signing yeah. uh, with after my game is already doing well. And trust me, when your game is doing well, they'll find you because they're, you know, those Steam DB charts and such. This is not a mystery. Like the easiest thing in the world for a publisher to do is sit there and look at games and see what their charts are and see which ones they're gaining. Um, the, you know, if, if you run the lineup of the sort of prestigious, you know, big, known indie publishers they all tried to you know they were all trying to negotiate for many of the games in our portfolio um it's it's because those all basically the games in our portfolio that were doing well that were already rising in each other, they heard from everyone um the games that were not doing um that, that were that, that like espiocracy the games that you know from inception we saw something good they never heard from those, those ones so that's just it, it's like a perfect read on it you know if, if yeah. your game is scoring up the charts expect to get emails from scouts from the big publishers but at that point you really have to ask yourself whether you need them because quite frankly the type kind of contract terms that we're failing the industry right now are horrendous um, you will find pretty much all of them asking for 100% recoup of their costs. And they'll be patting themselves on the back if they have the slightest bit of debt friendly nature to them. Like if they're like, oh, we only bill you external costs, you know, or something like that, they'll pat so back. Okay, but you're still taking 100%, right? So you're still recovering all of your costs. You know, the, the, and just, the, just to be um, clear on that, for anyone who doesn't understand 100% of recouping costs, so if a publisher is giving you, you know, here's, you need money to finish development of your game, that's a big water bottle, finish your game, it's like, here's $100,000, pay the team, get some beautiful art in there, and then when the game launches, the publisher's like, we get all the money, all the money, all the money, and then when we get all our money back, now we'll start to do our split. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. And so what you're essentially signing on to is, is, is a loan. Um, now, it's, it's a loan that doesn't need to be paid back if the game flops, right? But it, it's not that hard for a game to do well enough to make the publisher okay on recoup and to still eat up a lot of sales. 
And honestly, that having recoup is part of the reason that so many publishers are opportunistic is because they actually don't need to make all the games succeed. Even the ones that are doing like right. mid middling will often pay. I mean, that's the thing is it's really easy to abandon supporting a game that isn't doing as well as your other games publisher. If you know that you're going to get all of the profits up to a certain point from that game, because then at that point you even got to analyze like, well, why am I bothering trying to work it past that point? I already know I'm going to get to the point where I at least get my money back. Um, the, uh, you know, when publishers really, you know, you get to all this, I, I, I will say as an aside, there is absolutely no reason these recoup terms should exist. The idea that publishers should recover all of their costs before they start get or, or, or all the development fund they gave at least even in the friendliest version before developers get a dime is just, you know, it's, it's a product of lopsided bargaining power. And, you know, yeah. that has moved this industry in a stupid way, because think about, think about this way. Um, generally speaking in a contract, the, what this is, is risk allocation, who bears the risk of a failure, right? Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, the efficient thing in a contract is for the party that is most able to bear the risk, to bear that yeah. risk, the party that can divert and think about a publisher, a publisher has a diversified portfolio of games, a ton of them, they spread the risk among them, some outperform, some underperform, the outperformance makes up for the underperformance, they're doing okay, they can bear the risk, an indie developer that has one game, right. you know, every several years, they can't bear the risk. It, it's 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 ridiculous that they're forced to bear the risk of underperformance. Second point is, is that most of the time, very often, if a game fails, it's the publisher's fault. They didn't market it well, you know, and yet they're protected by the, the, these kind of terms. Um, it's just it's it, it's at the point where I mean I don't. I, I would not engage in that kind of a deal. I mean, even with the supposed, because frankly, even the supposed good publishers are often very opportunistic and will selectively market games. And so, you know, I go ahead. Uh, so, sorry, you, you, good point about keep your eyes open for recoup. Hundred percent recoup, not good. What else should we keep our eyes open for for an indie developer yeah. with a game and a publisher's like, yeah, come work with me, it'll be amazing. What else? What else is alarm bells that people should be looking out for? Yeah, that's that's a great question. You know, I think the way I'd answer it is I'm going to recommend a site. I'm basically going to recommend how I would research publishers and and to know whether because everyone's going to tell you about their experience in the industry and and you know they're going to have. I mean, frankly, they're going to have a website that looks better than mine. I barely put effort into emailing our website developer to update it because I know it's a ghost town. Um, you know, they're going to have all this indicia that make you think, oh, these guys know what they're talking about." But you can actually cut through that and see. And the way you cut through it is and you see results. And for this, I think probably the best thing would be to screen share if I could get that. So yep, I can just yep, go yep. and show. Yep, you request um, screen share, I'll give it to you. Yep. And you know, I've I've closed tabs. Please, everyone forgive me if you see something weird on my computer. I swear it's a giant mess. Um, I, need alt, so, I need an alt tab before I'm like, I don't I think there might have been some stuff in that alt tab that shouldn't have been, but anyway. One, one, one never does know. So I think I've got things mostly, unless a message pops up, in which case, awesome you know, that you, actually, I'm saying, uh, I better, I better close, getting... close off Skype so I get a message pop up. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, that's not good. Okay. Does cool. it look more reasonable? Oh, sorry. I was, I was hiding it. Just in case. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wide that's screen. Good. All right. Yeah. That's okay. I don't want to create the aspect ratio you got going on there. Yeah. I've got so many tabs open. So I can manage it. So are you able to see everything? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty okay, small, sure. but we can see. Okay. Um, yeah, it's uh, so. Here's what I would recommend. There is a site. This is the first step to an analyzing a publisher. It's called um, Steam uh, Steam uh, or Gaming Analytics .info. Apparently, all these sites I use are .info. I never even bothered paying attention. So, Gaming Analytics .info um, is the site's name. Uh, you can just, frankly, you just Google search like Steam Global which list analytics. So what I usually type is probably way too much and you'll get it right away. So th this is the site. Um, in order to get access to the data, you're going to need to subscribe to their Patreon for five bucks a month, unfortunately, uh, to get access to full data. If you're considering publishers, it's worth it to do that. Uh, because what you can do then is, so I went here to official, I, you know, the lightning bulb on the, are you able to see this clear enough? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, so am, but, yeah. yeah. Okay. So the little lightning bulb here on the left side, official Steam Global wish list. Once you're logged in, and I'm logged in, but again, it's it's like five dollars a month Patreon backing. Trust me, it's worth it to considering publishers. You then go to current top wish list. Okay. And what this is is now you've got the ability to type in any publisher's name that you like, and you can see how they're doing. Um, and there is, um, geez, I'm gonna get like someone like 
very angry at me if I show you a bad publisher. So, um, well, okay. So, so let me say this, do there are no bad do publishers. Do <laughs> there are reasons why things are the way they are. But at the same time, l let me compare two publishers for you. Okay, so, and nothing against them. I'm absolutely nothing saying nothing against them. This is a publisher, um, which if you look at, you've got a game doing very well, a couple of games doing okay, and then we go down the list. So it's uh, this is this is this is somewhat lopsided. I think anyone could agree that. I'm not saying anything negative about them though. If you look at a game, uh, another publisher, and this is this is what I would say is a pretty good a pretty good one, THQ Nordic, um, which is a, a very good publisher, very good at what they do. Um, you see, they've got some top games too, but it's sort of you know you see it's preserving better across the uh, you know it's not falling off the cliff as it were. Um, and you can search anything. And now I'm just going to randomly type in names. And I'm not really implying anything at all, but you know, another publisher that you see a nice distribution, right? Devolver, they're doing a good they're job. They're doing okay, it. I think Devolver. Yeah, yeah, and and they're doing good job for all their games. Is kind of what I'm getting at here. Like, you know, yeah, this is yeah. a. There's not like this is the game that's doing well, and then you get the games that aren't doing well. Um, that's not the yeah. case with Devolver. They are doing a good job for all their games. Um, and then you know, we can look at other publishers as well. We can look at, you know, Team you know, Seven. This is also. This is also a really powerful way to look at what sort of genre of games the publisher has. Um, yep. Obviously, you can go to their websites and have a look at it. But if they've got three uh, RTS games that are doing very well, then there's a chance they might be interested in talking to you if you're making an RTS game, po possibly. So. Yeah. Yes, it is. And, you know, at this point, I'm too nervous to show anyone that isn't, you know, new because I really don't want to. I'm not intending to make any further points. So I'll just show you ours, which I think is an example of a good publisher. That is to say, yeah. we don't fall off a cliff. You know, not the Falling right. Frontier isn't leading the charge here, but we've got a nice distribution down the list. And it's no accident that the one that's lowest on our list is our is newly announced. Um, you know, basically, and, and there's no, you know, this is this is I think a nice distribution. I think we do a good job for yeah. them. Um, so I'm gonna continue telling saying things based on us so that I don't have the nervousness that comes from trying to show anyone else a comment because I really don't want to imply anything about anyone else. Um, there are I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why things can be happening in portfolios. But anyway, the point is, I would look for a publisher that has a nice distribution. Because when you're seeing a distribution like this, you're seeing a publisher that is going to, they're going to do a good job for all their games. And they're trying to do a good job for all of their games. And I would look mm -hmm. not just at the total, you know, like how many followers total it has, although that's important. And you definitely should compare publishers on that basis, um, because you are seeing the actual marketing results on upcoming games there to compare. But I would also look at what's happening to that portfolio. So for instance, you know, um, these are the one day, seven day and one month changes in the ranking of the top wishlist list are the things generally rising. You know, gen this is the followers 24 hour count. You know, are the games generally going up? You know, basically is, is this number rising? Um, well, is, is sort of the question. So it's, um, you know, and, and, and again, there are, I, I don't want to at all claim that we're like the, you know, th this is unique because there are a lot of publishers. Again, I'm just going to keep praising Devolver because I love them. I think they're, they're great in a lot of ways. Uh, and Devolver shows the same thing, right? Like their games are generally going up. Their games generally distribute. Um, their games generally have good follower 24 hour accounts. So the, the, they're going up. They're doing a good job uh, with those games. So it's really just. They've got a very it, similar like mood and feeling to a lot of their games too. There is. They have a very like darker, they, cute, like weirder, like style to yeah. them, which is cool. yeah. Which they, they know exactly. it works, right? And they're sticking to yep. it. I think that's important for a publisher too. The, the and 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 like you were saying too, um, uh, is that it's um, there's an identity to it. You can tell whether they publish your sort of game because there really is a comp of particular sorts of games. You know, they're they're you know the game RTS games you were mentioning as an example. Are different. Marking RPS is different than marking another game. So this is um, this is sort of how I would look at things. Look for a nice, even distribution where things there isn't just top performer and then you know uh, things sort of drop off quickly. But but a sort of nice distribution is what I would say. And again, not implying anything negative about any other publisher. Um, it's just uh, if I'm giving advice to indie developers, I would say personally for me, I would look for someone that has that distribution. Um, because it means that they are delivering, you know, they're delivering results. And also, here's the other thing is you can also get an idea of the size of them. There's just no way I'm going to actually 
sh show you an example of this. Off my point is, if you look at a publisher and they've got like one game that is somewhere down at the bottom of the list, right? Like I'm coming to the end of the top wish list list here, the 1400 and stuff. If you're looking at a publisher and they've got like one game, and again, I'm not talking to anyone in particular down here, and that's their portfolio. Or if they got like three games and all of them are under a thousand followers or, you know, maybe just over, you know, you kind of get the idea of what kind of marketing reach they have. Um, and, you know, that's, that should be bearing in mind. It's not to say that they're not, um, they're not good because they easily could be. And a lot of these, by the way, these are self-published and stuff. But my point is that don't believe what they tell you about what they're doing for your game as being any different than what they've done for other games. Um, you know, look at what's actually yeah, happening. Um, that was my main advice to anybody is like, look at what they've published yeah. and look at what they've actually been able to achieve. How, how important is it that a publisher has a, an existing list of people that they can, you know, an, an email list or a, or a Twitter followers or something where there's people who are already digging that yeah. publisher's work and they can say, you know, yeah. when you're having a, a developer saying, tell us about yourselves. Like, well, we've got, you know, a million people on our email list, or we've got, you know, 300,000 Twitter followers. How much importance should we put in that in terms of predictability of, okay, when my game is is getting wishlist or launched, I know they're going to be able to give it a push. Yeah, Twitter followers are nothing for marketing. Um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, speaking as someone who's got, you know, the the, 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 this is my, we've got a pretty decent Twitter following. We got our little fancy blue check mark and stuff, and it does nothing. Organic, marketing on Twitter, I mean, Twitter ads, you got a different story. Um, but it's uh, it, the Twitter following allows nothing organic social media in general does not do much, at least it doesn't do enough to, to, to cause anything significant. Not to say that you can't, I mean, look, I mean, you can look at launches of some, some games. I mean, you know, it's this sort of stuff can lead to 100 wish list, a couple hundred wish lists, maybe because of their audience, and then that's, that's not not that's not anything that substantial in the life of the game. Also, this is really important, different games are, and it doesn't really predict performance. So this is, you know, we've got, if you compare our, um, you know, the, our, our top game, Falling Frontier, right? Um, this is, this is, you know, and we were to go to Todd's Twitter and don't, I'll, I'll pick it on a little bit. I have no idea whether there's an audience. This is not a big Twitter account. Uh, it's, 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 it, it, it's, it, it, it's a pretty, you know, it, it's pretty small in comparison. And you know, if Todd posts something, he's mostly reaching some things up there. It's all over Twitter. Um, there are other games that we, you know, like um, shoot. If we go to, I mean, th there are other games that are work very well on Twitter. Like I could just find, um, you know, uh, let me scroll through. Sorry, we've had some recent announcements, and I try to retweet everyone who does press an influencer. So it's uh, tends to get clogged. But in a second, I'll come up with a good example. Um, let's see. Here we go. So here's the, one of the games we just find, Sons of Valhalla. And, you know, they put out a tweet and they got 800 likes and, and 90 retweets and such. Because, quite frankly, this is perfect for Twitter. This game right here, people on Twitter love to see these scenes of the game and do it. And that's not to say that that's not very valuable for the game. It, it can be valuable. But it obviously doesn't match. You know, like, there's obviously the fact that Fong Petir doesn't do that has not held it back at all. Um, so Twitter is not a place to in for relatively few um there are relatively few organic social media outlets that would impress me about a publisher uh it would impress me a little more if they're very focused on genre because then maybe they're the people they have at least like that but it's just it's not it's not what does it i would actually look around i mean well you're getting the answer in the numbers so if you want to look beyond the numbers and actually see what's going on you can often sort of trace the history of a game. You can see what's going on with it. Like you could search for press articles. You can see what's going on in YouTube. You know, you can take a look at what's actually into the game. Um, you know, YouTube is a great place to go for that, right? So I could take right here. Oh, well, there we are. Um, look at that. <laughs> 121 people watching, apparently. So um, the, uh, but if, if, we, if we go like, you know, pull up some Fallen Frontier stuff, right? You know, you can see you know, this is the sort of thing that's driving it, right? You know, there are just views, views, 286,000 on that one, 266,000 on that one. Um, then it's getting to, well, that's a different game. That's one of our other games, Fragile Existence. But anyway, you get the idea. The, the, this sort of stuff does things. Um, getting major influencers to play it, getting, um, you know, get, getting featured on things like IGN, th this is going to actually move the game to people in a way that 
you know, publishers internal social media that tweet is never going to do. Um, the, uh, the same thing you have to watch out with for YouTube in judging, like I'll go to our Herder Horse YouTube channel and, you know, tell you to, to, to here I can pick on myself a little bit. That way I'm not uh, accused of anything. So like, if you look at our YouTube channel, you'll see like, oh, well, look, everything we do, 5,000 to 10,000 views. Yeah, some of these are ad views. Like we run some ads on YouTube too, to the videos. So right. these aren't really real. Yeah, if I put a, if I put a trailer out on YouTube without running significant ads, it does not get five to ten thousand views on its own. And this is a small scale too. Um, some publishers run massive YouTube advertising, and you'll see that they put out trailer on their YouTube channel, and it's got a hundred thousand or a million, millions in some case views. That doesn't really mean that they have that reach. That means they've spent a lot of ad dollars having that happen. Um, which isn't necessarily the most efficient thing. Um, oh, by the way, the, the, I mean, th this is what does, this is a good thing. To, I mean, this content creators, right? Content creators should cover it. This is the kind of thing that actually does a lot for a game. Um, the, uh, yeah, so that, that's my thoughts on that. Maybe I should turn off screen sharing now because I think I've probably made my point on those things. Um, yeah, I'm, so I've had a few questions. Number one would be, um, you said you have a few relationships with a few content creators, but the ones you don't have like a core relationship with, is it just like send them an email? Hey, here's the key to the game. Is that yeah. the correct? Well, I should, I should start by saying that anyone that sort of like touts their relationships as a reason to sign with them as publisher is kind of just, they're talking themselves up and trying to get you to think they have the golden key. The reality is that yes, we, we do know some content creators. No content creator we know is going to cover a game just because we asked them to do it, right? They're going to cover a game. Right. They saw, they see the game. It was presented in a professional manner. They liked it and they decided to cover it. We have absolutely no golden keys. I'm, I'm going to say this right at the beginning. There is no golden key. There's nothing that an indie dev couldn't potentially do for themselves. Um, you know, if you've got a game, like the, when it comes to content creators, a list, yes, a list helps. You can, but you know, what a lot of publishers do is they'll blast a gigantic list um, that is just like, you know, primarily people aren't even interested in that type of game. Uh, some people will be in there and sometimes you get people with broader interests, but frankly, an indie developer can approximate like 70% of the benefit at least by just going out there and basically researching some content creators on YouTube. Look for similar games on YouTube and, and Twitch, see yeah. who's playing their similar games, get their information. Yeah, you're going to spend a day doing it, but you have a list, get, get, get yourself the 30 or 40 or 50 or whatever best, you know, target content creators to create yeah. your kind of game. Send them a nice heartfelt email. That's the other thing is. I don't even know whether it's better coming from a publisher, right? Because I mean, no one really likes publishers. Let's get let's get this straight. No one really likes us. I mean, not that we don't like we we don't try to be nice. And yes, we've got some friends, but you know, it's no one. Well, let me put it this way: no one likes publishers as much as they like developers. That is absolutely true. No email from a publisher is going to necessarily be better than an email from an indie developer where they're where they do things right. Now, it's better if the indie developer is doing something like wrong and how they did it like so what do you do with influencers look up some of you know look up advice on how to contact influencers you know have a concise email put the steam key at the top so you see right away you're sending them a key let them know why it's relevant to them because god knows those content creators have their inboxes filled with emails from publishers and pr firms and all these people who blast everyone with no relevance to like how relevant yeah. th that content is for them let them know right away in a concise way that this is why this is their kind of game. Give them the key. And you know what? That's the best chance to take a look at it. There's and, nothing a publisher can do except pay people, which – go ahead. And, and yeah, I was going to ask on that. So um, there's a lot of YouTubers, influencers nowadays that are like, I'll happily look at your thing if you pay me $10,000. So uh, as an indie game developer, do you recommend staying away from that and just 100% focusing on – here's my game. And if you think it's good content for your channel, then job done. Or uh, is that just, is that part of the industry going away? Is it becoming more and more, if I've got a YouTube channel with a million subs, I'm, I'm wanting my 10, 20, $50,000 per video. Why would I do something for free? Like, what do you see in terms of that part of the trend of paid influencers or paid YouTubers for, for indie game developers? Yeah, so here, here's what I think. The um, it's it's not the the it, it it in terms of ways in which a publisher can spend the money and the effects that it has. I mean, quite frankly, you know, Tim, we were talking about this. It's easy to be bad at ads. Uh, you're better off if your publisher is spending money on you. You're better off that they give that money to a good YouTuber and Twitch uh, or Twitch streamer to cover the game than they blow it on bad ads. Um, you know, it, it's definitely true. 
Uh, the and there is the, these YouTubers and Twitch streamers. They work very hard, and they, they do deserve support. Um, I will say that you know our own approach at Ours, we're we're a new publisher. Um, we haven't you know we, we don't have quite the barrels of money that you know many of the other publishers have to throw at things, and we generally try to be very uh, you know concentrated in what we what we do with the indie developers' budgets and in, in, in terms of our promise marketing. So it, it's we have we haven't done paid sponsorships with YouTubers and Twitch streamers, um, which uh, isn't because we don't want to support them. Um, we're going to look for ways to support them, probably outside of traditional sponsorships, but rather just you know thank thank yous and things like that, and, and various ways we can give them some financial support um, too. But all this is a little bit talking in the future. The point is that what has caused people when they've covered our games. Is I think that they recognize that we're we're publishing smaller indies. They recognize that we ourselves are our smaller company, and they're willing to take a look if they like the game. And um, and I think that's true. The, the 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 vast, I think probably the vast majority of content creators are very willing to look at a game that um, that is from an indie developer and and know that that indie developer can't pay them thousands of dollars, but take a look at it and say, oh, you know what, this is my kind of game. Let me play it. Where you're going to have the need to definitely have the need to play them is if you want them to play games that really aren't games that they they, they would love themselves. Yeah. Um, the uh, so if you're if you're doing what I just said, which is don't play. I mean these. I mean you have to understand these PR firms that 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 and, and the publishers that sort of spam everyone. They're they're like just spam all the big guys they possibly can, right? Yeah. If you're instead of approach of looking for the ones that are the most relevant um, and finding the ones that you know just would really like your content. You get a much better chance than covering it. I do want to caveat all this by saying that I think that you know, as a publisher, um, it's it's our, our responsibility, especially as we grow, to find ways to support YouTube, and Twitch streamers, to the extent we have capability uh, to do so. And you know, we we've started. I, I'm very incomplete on this, but I've started trying to find some of the ones who have done good things for us and back them on Patreon and such, and try to show support towards them because they really do deserve financial support. As any publisher, we should be doing our part to support them. So that they have the extra time, so that they get the reward they need, and they have the extra time to do things for all the indie devs. Um, but I don't think it's it, it's it's something that it should be conceived of as a barrier uh, to um, getting them to play. If, if they really like the game, I think they're going to take a look at it. Yeah, that's dude. This has been super super helpful. I really appreciate you sharing all this knowledge. It's been great. I, I, I could listen in... to you forever. So I asked in the chat if there's any any last questions for rapid fire, like uh, you know, sit you on the I don't even know a good TV show to reference there, but the rapid fire yeah, questions, like the the well, 10 questions my, in one minute kind of thing. Well, yeah, let, let's let's take that. So I mean, I have been completely ignoring chat. I'm sorry, I just don't have the ability to look at both things. So if anyone wants to ask anything um, uh, of me, I'm happy. Yeah, that's to, right. Yeah. 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 Tim and I have been watching the chat, so we've only been listening to maybe 5% of what you've been saying because we're just so busy watching the chat. I've been taking it all in. I'm trying to yeah, launch been, another Steam game this year. Yeah. So I'm, actually, on that, while we're waiting for questions, um, what do you think is probably the two or three most important things on a Steam page as far as like what to focus on? Well, you know, I think that uh, you want to make it visually engaging. Um, don't make it a wall of text. Uh, you know, ha have some some visual content there. Uh, but I would also I, I would also say that focus on what's unique about the game. There are just so many games on. I mean, don't try to make it look like the biggest you know hit game that you think everyone loves. Exactly. Instead, try to show what's unique and interesting about your game because that's what really makes people. I mean, when you think about it, especially if you're if you're upcoming, right? Because if you're an upcoming game, you're asking people to wishlist it. You need people excited enough that they're not just you know, like, oh, I can play this today. Maybe I'll buy it or check it out. You need people excited enough where they say, wow, this is one that I want to mark to come back to and look at again. And I want to be reminded of every time it goes on sale. You you don't need 10 people who are like, eh, maybe I'd play that. You need the one person who loves it, right? Um, that, right. That, that's how to do it. So make people fall in love with your game. Tell them what's unique about it. Don't be afraid of the weirdness of your game. You know, embrace the unique aspects of it bring that out and show them why they should yeah. love this game, why it's, it's worth marking to come back to or worth buying if it's for sale. Awesome. So cool. first big question that people have joined late is, uh, are we actually in April or are we still in December? Because of your, it's blowing people's minds. The fact you got a Christmas tree, I think you should leave it there all year round just so people are like, what's going on? Yeah. So yeah, it is a Christmas tree. No, it's not Christmas at the moment. This is live. 
Um, question uh, in terms of region. So if someone's located in country X and you're in country Y, does that matter? Does someone need to be in the US of A to catch it, capture your attention or is it just not matter? And we kind of know the answer given that we spoke with Todd, you know, a couple of weeks ago and he's in Australia, but is, you know, quick, short answer to that. Does it matter? Not for us. Um, we've got, I mean, people working for our company, we've got people in Europe, um, we got Japanese marketing called Japan, you know, it's, uh, and I stay up all sorts of times to meet with people. My sleep schedule does not appreciate the fact, but yes, we, we do publish games for people all over the world. Uh, time zone is not a concern. Gotcha. Yeah. I hear you on that. Um, how do you, should you be worried about your protecting your IP about a publisher stealing your game? This is a question from the chat. Uh, how to avoid a, a publisher stealing your game. I know that's a very inflammatory way of phrasing it, but <laughs> no, no, I, I, I get it. a smart way for a developer to approach IP protection. I don't think you have to worry too much about it. I mean, I never want to give anyone guarantees, right? Because then something horrible happens. But the only time I can, I can think of, of a PC game. Now, by the way, I'm talking just, I probably should stress at the beginning. I mean, we are a PC game publisher. That's probably evident from what I've been saying about Steam and such. Uh, mobile is a different world entirely. Um, I've yeah. heard of all sorts of crazy things happening there. So I would be careful. If you're mobile, do not take security from what I'm saying. If you're a PC game publisher, the only instance that I really know of where I've seen an idea stolen and a concept for game stolen is the one that I had us look at. And I'm not basically saying, and, and just to be clear, I'm not saying that it was stolen. It just looks suspicious similar um the uh and and came afterwards in time and sounds just happens insane. to be a clone oh, by accident. accident just a coincidence <laughs> so uh yeah uh, so that's the only one i know and look manor lords is um manor lords like pull up the steam db chart, DB chart for manor lords you'll find that it, it's in the top 20 most wishlisted games on steam it's one oh, of wow. the oh yeah it's huge manor lords is absolutely huge it's trailers have millions of views on youtube this is a huge game that is going to release at the top it was rising very fast to the top, do, you know, doing amazing when, you know, when that other game came along, yeah. meaning that unless your game is like popping the Steam charts, I don't think anyone's likely to, to, to try right. to copy it. Um, it's uh, there's just too many, th there's too many ideas and most publishers are afraid of trying something new and, and innovative anyway. So, you know, I mean, it's yeah. like they like the tried and true anyway. So there's just, yeah. it, it, I don't really we, we that much work. We talk about that a lot, a lot here. That if you have success, people will want your success. So there's a lot of people saying, "Oh, I haven't got success yet. Should I be worried?" It's like, don't worry about it, man. When when you get a bazillion wish lists, that's when people are going to come after you. But it's I don't think the publisher is who you need to worry about. It's as soon as you start being vocal about what you're up to and people see it being a good idea, they're going to say, "Oh, let's make that as well." So, you know, I, yeah. I don't see publishers trying to steal games. Why would they? They want to keep the one they've got and and you know, within that realm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's it, it's not the biggest concern. At the very least, if you are afraid of that and it's stopping you from doing what you need to put that game out there, then it's it, it's counterproductive because really the the danger to an indie developer is obscurity. It's it's that that that's that's the ever lurking danger. Overcoming that is what you need to put your attention to. Yep. Uh, other team, have you spotted any questions in here? Other Tim, am I other Tim now? I, is I don't that know, man. I, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, I see how it is. I'm just brain. other Tim. Okay, oh. here, is, here is one final question on that sort of legality type stuff. Um, what should an indie game developer bother spending time and effort on when it comes to things like copyright, trademarks, um, company incorporation, uh, protection point of view? It, if you've got a game, Manor Lords, and you, you trademark Manor Lords, someone's going to come along and just call it you know, Castle Kings, it's it, protecting actual manor lords. Uh, my understanding of it is if you've got something that exists in the public domain on Steam, you've already got that Steam presence as manor lords, you don't need to go and spend the extra money to trademark that. However, that's me just sort of plucking it out of my non-legal, le legal, non-lawyer lawyer butt, I guess. What do you think about that? What should people do to be buttoned up? So the problem here is, is that I used to be a lawyer about a decade ago. And that as a lawyer, no, I, no, it's the opposite is I'm going to shake in fear about declaring anything about IP law when people listening could be in any jurisdiction across the world. Um, it's uh, there's what I will say generally is this in terms of priority is that um, I would, uh, 
you know, the, the, the trademark thing, I think I would, I mean, look, I'll only say what I'm doing, which is I'm, I don't think it's the thing I'm rushing to do. Um, the, uh, not to say that you shouldn't do it or figure out what jurisdiction is, but this is, I mean, it, it's, it doesn't seem to me the most pressing thing to confront in terms of company formation, uh, which you also mentioned, um, do you form an LLC or something like that? Um, I will say that I would never advise people not to do it, uh, but there is this uh, trend of people online talking about LLCs and the corporate shield as a protection that applies to them. Generally speaking, they vastly overestimate how much protection there is. That's and okay. thank you. Yeah, and especially the, the, single the, member LLCs. Yeah. You, okay. You guys know exactly what I'm going to say. I feel like I'm going to repeat it, which is that if you do something personally, then they're not going to sue just your company. They're going to sue you and the company. Exactly. And since they all hide behind you, the company, they're like, I'm going to come get yeah. your house. Well, it was the company. It's like, no, no, it was you did the dumb thing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The, 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 the corporate shield protects you when you start having employees and, and staff and a bunch of people out there. It, mm -hmm. it, will, it just doesn't protect you for what you do individually because you can be sued in your individual class and the company, just like you're saying. So the thing is what I, I mean, I'm not saying now it can be very good to form one and it's usually not that expensive. I would watch out for your jurisdiction though. There are, uh, take for instance, here in the United States, if you're in the state of California and you form mm -hmm. an LLC, get ready for an $800 minimum tax bill every year for that LLC. Even if you in don't have a corporation in California and you happen to live in California, they still try to get you. I know there's, from there's, personal experience. California is very aggressive. So yeah. it's you have to look at your jurisdiction. And if they're going to charge you a lot every year and you don't have that, you maybe think there, there are things like small business shirts you could look into. All that having anyway, so this is a complex topic, but yeah, those those are my my couple of uh my cup my couple of comments on that. So um awesome. it looks like yeah, it looks like there's a lot of, I mean, I could just go through here in the chat and start answering these things. Um, there's one, there's one that Lottie's asked a couple of times about, um, or, or the general, when, when is it too late to go to the publisher? If you've already got your game in early access, it's out there. Is that too late? And then also what to do about, uh, last mile marketing, um, you know, in terms of, of later on or, or later on in the process. Yeah, so I, I think so. The 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 first, let me answer the second one, which is that. So if um so if the in, in the run up to launch, you should try to market as much as possible. Of course, um you often have the game near complete. It's a very good time to go contact influencers and give them a key to that game, uh, because it's almost complete. And do bear in mind, especially if you're not paying them and you're not the biggest launch happening in that couple of weeks, they aren't going to play on the exact day you want them to play. So give them right. some time. You know what I mean? You're, you're, you know that you're not paying them. You know that you're not the biggest thing out there. So don't expect them to play right the same day you give it to them. You know, don't give it to them two days before release and think, okay, they're all going to play it. And it's no way it's, it's, you send it to them. It might be a week before they open your email. It might be a month before they check out the game, but as your game goes close towards release, what I would focus on as an indie dev is basically get a good build ready for those streamers, influencers, send it out many weeks in advance, several weeks in advance, uh, and basically just make it simple for them, you know, give them the key and basically say, you welcome all coverage, uh, you know, maybe form a little press kit that's got some things they could use or something, but basically get that key out there to influence what I would do. Um, if you're, if you're facing things sort of very close to release, um, could you remind me of the first question uh, that, that was out? Yeah. That's in, right. in terms of, um, when is it, too too late to approach a publisher with your game if it's already in early access if it's been launched a year if okay. it's kind of sitting there and no one's played it for you know for six months whatever when when is the sweet spot it sounds like you know early is better than later but when's when's just too late for people who've already got games out there okay so the, 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 there's a couple ways to answer that the first one is most publishers, if asked this question, will say approach them as early as possible. They like to be on board for the launch of the store page. This is true, by the way. I definitely prefer that because launching a store page with um, an, a you know properly timed and planned can be a huge burst of visibility. I definitely prefer to get on before the store page is launched. Um, so they'll say you know contact a, you know in advance. Um, they'll want they'll say they can have more input and how things develop. Um, the reality, the problem you're having in all this is your bargaining power is less unless you've already created a prior hit game. If you create a prior hit game, again, I'm classifying that off because I'm assuming that isn't most people asking this question. If you haven't created a prior hit game, you have very little bargaining power until your game starts you know, doing well. 
And so if you really do want a publisher, I would honestly focus first on indie marketing and making that game do well. I would try my best to do these things that make it work well. And I'd make that chart look good because then you'll have better publishers to select from. You can negotiate better deals. And those publishers might tell you, oh, I wish you'd contacted me way back and we could have done such a better launch. And in the back of the mind, you know, yeah, they would have ignored your email or they would have offered you, you know, like you wouldn't have been able to get the same terms. It's the, the reality is what people say they want. It, it doesn't really match necessarily always what your interest is. And I think your interest is, is to is to make it as successful as possible as an upcoming game. I will say that you're better off approaching them before early access launch, and you definitely are better off doing it, you know, six months or more before your early access release or your 1.0 release, whatever the release is. You're best off before release, six months before. Um, that's not to say that's always needed, uh, you know, and definitely we consider games that are not in that state. But it's, uh, you know, it's I, I consider early access games potentially if they fit well. Um, but the reality is that those are really good opportunities for, uh, for, I mean, it's sort of like similar to the, like, we wish you'd, we'd been on board from the beginning and we could have made the store page launch. Is that the early access release is much more significant than that, um, you know, than the, store, than the store page reveal. And you do, if you're going to be successful, it, it's, very, it's relatively few games. It does happen. But it's relatively few games that will be not successful on Steam, upcoming marketing, are not gathering wish lists, but release on early access, and suddenly they got a bunch of wish lists. That usually doesn't happen. Usually, if you're, you know, usually the marketing is, is a little bit more consistent there. So if you, there are things that you can do to make the game register it and perform well in early access, those same things you can do to make it perform well as an upcoming game. I mean, heck, delay your re planned release in some case. If you were going to do an early access at such and such date, get to that date, have a great build that's ready for influencers, send that out to, don't release the game, send out that build to influencers, generate traction on the game, and then on the wave of influencers covering it, you know, then start reaching out to publishers and just plan that you'll release six later, week, you know, six uh, months later than you intended. And you, you know, six months will be put to good use anyway. Uh, I, I would do something like that because I really, if, if you're going to do a deal with a publisher, and again, frankly, I would not do deals under the terms that publishers generally operate on. I would not do 100% recoup deals. Um, but if you're going to do that, if you want that sort of thing, um, I, I would make your game as successful as possible beforehand in a numbers way because that's what's going to get you the best possible publisher and the best possible deal. Yeah. Go Real ahead. quick, what do you yeah. think is a fair recoup percentage? I mean, I think flat rates are the way it should go, and that's what I prefer. Um, so I, I think that it should be flat rates. And I think, generally speaking, um, unless the – again, unless the flat publisher rate is – being – sorry, like you 40% every month, whatever, or like – Yeah. I describe mean, flat rate, basically. That's a good point, is that I think that – first of all, I think that – Generally speaking, publisher contracts, you've got quarterly payments. Um, you know, they, they owe you money every quarter, it's only like 30 or 60 days after the end of the quarter. That should be monthly for the first couple of years after release. Totally fine to do it quarterly later uh, when things slow down, like two years after release or something, but it should be monthly at the beginning. And you know, you've got to you've got to understand that cash flow is just like a huge issue to you as, a, as an indie developer. And if you have yeah. to wait like three months plus God knows how many days, plus Steam takes a while to pay too. Steam, you know, will pay yeah. in like 30th of the month following, you could be waiting six months sitting there waiting for any money to show up. And that's a really bad position to be in, even if the game has already overcome its recoup, um, which very few would do right away. Uh, so it's it's uh, cash flow is important. So so monthly, you mentioned monthly, that is actually critical. It's one of those terms that people don't look at. It's not just the splits, the cash flow, not quarterly, monthly at the beginning. The second one is that um, you know a, a flat rate, the way I think things should work and the way the majority of our publishing contracts work is that we have a just a percentage split um, again monthly pay to the end. So you know it's uh, the most standard one that we use. You know would be basically the majority of our games we get between thirty five and fifty percent of revenue. Uh, the developer gets you know in, in case we're getting thirty five, developer gets sixty five. In the case we're getting forty, developer gets sixty, and so forth. And then we for the got lifetime a couple, of the game. Yeah. So <laughs> I, we do perpetual deals. Some publishers do time limited deals. Um, it's not something that we would do because we intend to support everything long term mm -hmm. and really focus on it. So it, it's not something that we do, um, but some publishers can do it. There is an advantage to that, especially if the publisher, you're not sure the publisher can be very good. At least, you know, there's a date when you can get the game back. But generally speaking, most sales are going to happen during the early uh, years anyway. Um, so but yeah, I, I mean, I think the idea if oh, so, well, let me say this. If the publisher is funding everything from inception. Um, then I think it's fair for them to, to go above 50%. Um, but if the publisher is not 
funding everything from uh, above 50 percent like as, as the flat rate and of course there could be edge cases like 55 percent or something but basically i don't think there should be a long term I, I generally speaking i think if the publisher is not bearing the the vast majority of the development expenses and that and and you really have to figure all your time that went into it before the publisher got on board right if that's not happening the publisher shouldn't be over 50 percent um somewhere in the range of 35 to 50 percent i think that's generally we operate um it's uh the uh and if and i think that's basically the and that's you know again if we're only doing market localization we're usually asking for 35 percent um and sometimes a little bit lower if a game has already had a lot of success because we want and to no that. Re recoup did i get that and no recoup. That, that's the fair so thing, yes. flat rate no okay that, that's what i think is the fair thing again yeah. i've had yeah. situations but i've had situations where i was saying to the developer let's do this deal um you know you get all this and it always involves development funding because we're going above 35 percent we're providing development funding um and generally speaking the development funding going forward um so I've had a situation where like, okay, this is something where I would ask 40% as the flat rate, but the developer has said, what we would really much prefer is that you have 35% long-term, but initially you get 15% for a period of time. So you start at 50 and drop to 35. I've done that for, for, for some developers. Um, and we've had some deals that end up like that. Uh, and so it's kind of like a recoup type of deal. Kind of, yeah. I mean, but yeah, I okay. don't, Go, yeah, but it, it's trying to control it. And we've had um, and we've had some games where we've just had, I mean, look, here's another one, is we had one particular game where the developer had really sort of like, I, I'm not I'm not on, there's no way anyone could guess, so I know I'm protecting privacy, but had drained their own retirement accounts a little bit for to fund their game to get to the point to go out of this. It was really important to them that they have a big salary that allows them to pay back their retirement accounts um, from us provide for development funding. So for that game, we have um, we ask for fifty percent long term, and then we get a little bit more than fifty percent at the beginning. Not a hundred percent, nowhere near that. Um, just a little bit more at the beginning, and it was expressly because the developer basically wanted to take some profits at the beginning. They wanted the ability to sort of provide security for their family or pay their retirement, that sort of thing. So we have, you know, as well as providing full development funding going forward. So there are scenarios where. But we would never ask for 100% recoup. Um, and we honestly, the vast majority of our contracts are simple flat splits, where we take between 35 to 50%, depending on You're what like we're a providing. human focused publisher, and I love it. And I, yeah, and thanks for sharing Thank the so numbers much. with us. It helps. There's folks out yeah. there like, I don't know, is it 10? Is yeah. it 100? What, what numbers? So it's really cool yeah. numbers. Yeah. And I've got one last question. We should let you sure. go in a moment. But, uh, one last question, um, and in our community here, we've spent a lot of time chatting about game design, about marketing, about ideas, about having a game that stands out. And it's not me, Tim, it's not me coming up with this, completely zero to do with me. But our community, independent of me, not me, has come up with an idea, a core idea for a game, just wondering if this is the sort of thing that's of interest to you as a publisher. So the core hook of the game is you play as a dog that's dragging itself around on its butt. And I'm wondering, what we can do to have that game, it's not me, remember, it's the community, to have that game appeal to a publisher and stand out. You know, there's something fun and humorous about that moment of the dog doing that. I'll take it off just in case it's grossing you out. Um, but what what do we need to do to turn that into something that's a publishable idea? And you watch chat light up with excitement here. <laughs> so, well, the first thing I'll say is, I, so this would not be within our, you know, genre focus. Oh, Tim, oh, oh, Tim, oh, you've crushed us <laughs> already. The community, oh. <laughs> Unless, like, the dog rules one nation, it's a war with another nation, or it's like, part of the dog and maybe we can so, make that happen. Um, yeah. <laughs> turn it into everyone, a simulation game. Help us turn this into something that Hooded Horse would be uh, interested in. <laughs> a management simulation where you try to feed as many dogs as you can. And get, no, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, or like, RPG quest of the dog going. No, it, it isn't. It isn't our. It isn't in our scope. But I can answer in general, uh, and that's true. Again, I, I want to say that I think that it's good for publishers to have a little bit of scope and know their competency because marketing your game will be different than marketing the games that we market. Um, strategy and RPG games would market differently than your game. So I, I will confess at the outset that I am not the best person to give you a marketing plan for this game or something because it's. You know, everyone's got their expertise, right? You're the game taking such game. a safe, serious way to this topic, which is <laughs> I, sorry. I, I, I think everything. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know. So, so here, here's what I would think, though. 
I, I mean, it sounds like the kind of game that may be effectively marketed on TikTok um, and, mm. and Twitter and such. This is, yes. um, some, some games are very, I mean, games differ. I mean, I showed you the difference between Sons of Valhalla and, and Fallen Frontier on, uh, on Twitter. Some games are better for Twitter. Some games are better for TikTok, you know? Mm. So right. those, those are forums where this sounds to me like the sort of thing that you would want to go to. Um, I would say that I probably wouldn't plan on any ads for it. And the reason I say that is, is that, one one thing to note is that of all the other you know Tim of all the other cautions that we were talking about any devs with ads is also the note that generally speaking we run ads to games that sell twenty dollars or more twenty dollars to forty dollars or usual range um, it's much safer to get a return on ad spend in that range if your game costs less than twenty dollars it's really tough for ads to do anything because you're yeah. you're you're yeah. paying for competing with the same people so this is not a game that you would sell for that much. You probably sell this game for five dollars or, or, or less, um, so you're not going to run ads on this game. Um, okay. It's there are probably some influencers who like like goofy mime games, so I would mm -hmm. go like look up some other ones that sort of had this sort of like goofy mime kind of appeal, and I'd try to see which influencers covered it on YouTube, and 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 okay. then I would I would basically contact them. So I would okay. do all of that, and then and also I would make a very visual Steam store page. So I would I would like have gifts up there of this and. You know, and basically, and then. So what yeah. I what I appreciate that is what I'm hearing out of this is you see this game has massive potential that uh, Hooded Horse <laughs> might not be might not be a, a big enough publisher for us to approach, and we need to think. Right, right. Big. Yep. Okay, got yep. it. And then, and then, but but it's I can see you're also just this is a negotiation. I get what we're doing here. You're like, I don't know if this is for us. <laughs> okay, okay, fine. We'll we'll let you have a higher well, percentage. I'm, I see this is a negotiation. Okay. I get it here. Playing hard to get. <laughs> yeah it's 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 yeah it, it's uh yeah it's well anyway that. that it's all that yep. anyway anyway that's a bit of fan service um, for the community but i appreciate appreciate that answer and all of your answers and giving us uh, so much of your time so generously thanks for joining us today and you're mentioning before yeah. that your discord server is a great place for people to find you so uh just go and google hooded horse discord i imagine yeah i mean uh you know it's i Actually, don't know what happens if you Google on Discord. Is a Discord link show? I mean, you might just. The put one good Twitter. thing about your website, it's got all your socials on it. So I was about to go to your website and say, "Here's <laughs> yeah. how you you freaked out every yeah. time I've shown the website." So I've been very scared. Well, it's not very good. It, it's really. Yeah. I got to tell you, it, it's it's. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm yeah. having it redesigned because I know some people. You know, I got to tell you, when it comes down to it, like the only reason I'm like spending any time on the website is because occasionally the game developers who look at a publisher's website and say, well, I can judge right. their market by how well they market themselves on their website. Yes. And then, you know, the reality is websites for indie publishers are ghost towns. They're just like, I get, you know, 10,000, literally 10,000 times the traffic of that is going into our socials. You, you know, it's, yeah. it's, go, I mean, it's just, it's so not worth paying so you, attention you to. You need I to have something, something polished enough that people will see that you're credible and real, but you don't want to overinvest in it. It's just the bare minimum, but you do have yeah. all of your social media stuff on there. So folks can go yeah. to Hooded Horse. Yeah, and our, and our Twitter links at all too. If you just look up Hooded Horse Twitter, you'll have ours and, you know, there's a Discord awesome. link there in our bio. And, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, and our Steam publisher page is where you can find all the games. Yep. Cool. Okay, and well, then, you know, I should say, if anyone does want to reach me, uh, if you are a strategy RPG, so I, I, at this point, I'm just, you know, I'll do the self-serving tiny bit. I've tried to be objective as possible throughout the thing. For a moment of self-serving, if you do have a strategy RPG or simulation game that you're looking at publishers, and again, that's conceived broadly, roguelikes, strategic elements, you know, anything that has those elements, um, publishing at hoodedhorse.com, or just to be safe, you can go on the website and check our you know, developer section for, for a link and such, or you can reach me on Discord by just joining our Discord and messaging uh, Hooded Horse. Uh, you know, that's yeah. me there. Gotcha. So expect to see in six months time, um, Draggy Horse, the real-time strategy adventure game coming your way. There you go. Tim, yeah. dude, thank you so much for sharing everything that you've shared. This has been super helpful. You've been super transparent. You've, you've not only shared a lot of stuff about you yourself and your own publisher, but also about a lot of other publishers and what to look out for. And dude, so many people are lost in their game development journey. And I appreciate you doing this so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad really to provide really whatever information I can. And really thank you both for having me. I enjoyed the conversation and you know, I am uh, hope this is the start of a friendship between us. Anytime you guys want to contact me about anything, I'll be glad to chat. You know, one final thing too, uh, you publish Old World. Uh, yes. Next time you talk to Soren Johnson, tell him some random Tim you talk to really loves his podcast and has listened to it like a dozen oh, yeah, times over. 
I'll tell him that. Fantastic. That's fantastic. Yep. <laughs> yeah. he, he has a great podcast on game design if anyone's looking into that. In the Designer audience. notes um, in case anybody's listening. Yeah. Designer notes. It's definitely. my favorite game dev podcast by far. There's nothing like it that just goes through developers' journeys. Uh, so yeah. That's amazing. Uh, my, my, I think my dog finally showed up there. She, she's like, yeah, she's I like, promise her. Doggo. So. Draggy, draggy what? Oh, coincidence? I think not. I see our target audience right there. It's like, I, I'm digging that. <laughs> yeah, do you need yeah. a math prop for your game? Yeah. I, I so I'm, I'm going to push the end stream button, which I think means we get, uh, it's going to cut us off 30 seconds ago. Okay, we need to talk for another 30 seconds from this sure. point. Well, and our next 30 seconds is probably going to be chopped off. I don't know why this streaming tool does this, but uh, anyway, what's your so doggo's name? I am um, Celeste, so like the character from Final Fantasy VI. Oh. Um, so she's, wow. yeah, she's okay. Yeah, Someone's she's a video, a video game dude. Nice. I like yeah, it. Well, I mean, she's, she'd be a great warrior. She's big. So, you know, Celeste was a great warrior in Final Fantasy VI. And then, of course, you know, the, the white theme of the white cape and everything. So, it's a big white fluffy dog. So it doesn't really go much more than that. <laughs> it's nice. a beautiful dog. So I, yeah. I'll hit the end stream now. I think thanks for filling on that last little bit. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Thanks everyone for your questions Bye, today. Everybody. And uh, sorry if we chop off any part of the last stream. Um, yeah. The last, it's one of those things, Tim. I don't know why yeah. it does it, but anywho.